We're coming. Perfect. All right. Scott, maybe we'll turn yours a little bit towards. Perfect. Yes, cozy. Bring it in. Um, yes. So, um, start. Wait. Push my chair back. It's a staring competition, guys. <laughs> Better. On one leg. <laughs> Just do some pose shots. There's cameras. I think we're going to have a warm-up Rocky Balboa music or something to let us know <laughs> when to start. OK, we're ready to go, guys. Sorry for the awkward beginning. And I have uh, a special announcement, which is we're not going to talk so much about fundraising, but what to do when you have raised a lot of money and need to grow in terms of your people count, scale up in terms of your employee count. And I think there's so many issues, so many challenges, so many new challenges right now that we're facing. So I think, Andrian, I, uh, maybe I'll begin with you. Um, when I think of a startup in the early stage, company culture is very much hinged and, and dependent on your founders. Yeah. Not so much when you're in your growth stage and rapidly growing. How do you maintain and actually foster a company culture when the founders are way, way outnumbered? So first of all, you've got to have a vision inside your head. What's going to be with the company in a year, two, five years? But the main thing, you've got to have a vision of what you want to bring to this world with the, your company, in my opinion. So that's why we've been starting with uh, the main problem we did have at that time when we started a company uh, one year and, tw and two months ago, it was the main problem in e-commerce. Mm -hmm. And me personally trying to resolve those issues, they were like nothing. So that's why you've been trying to attract more friends. And then after that, uh, those friends inviting more friends. And then you're like, oh my gosh, we need to build a company now. And then after that, you do understand that well, I do need to have HR person. And if you build in a company, you do need to know that HR person in your company is number one person who has to be. Because uh, this person will be hiring all of the people and this person will be uh, supporting your role in the team. This person will help in even you when you have uh, time of, you know, when, when, when you have this vision inside your head, but then you still have some doubts, will you be able to do this? Uh, then, then you and your team, they do have to support you. So it's like, you know, changing the energy between you guys inside the team. So if you do have the vision of uh, something you want to bring into this world, uh, you need to find those people who are helping you to bring this vision. And after that, making sure that you're not uh, trying to attract the wrong people. Right. And Melania, what do you think? Yeah, I think it's interesting. We, uh, we actually have two offices. So we have one in London and one in Madrid. Um, so we have one of the founders out there. And we actually don't have uh, any of the founders in our office. Um, and I think about kind of six, seven months in, we were talking about it. And we were like, oh, we've got these very, very different cultures between the offices. Like, things are really different. And we were like, how do we bring this together? How do we make sure that everybody is aligned? And then we realized, well, why does, why does it need to be? You know, culture doesn't need, mean that it needs to be the same everywhere. Um, you just kind of, kind of have to come from the same values. So even if it manifests itself in different ways, as long as people are collaborating and they're working together um, and they understand what you're trying to do in terms of the business, I think you can kind of be a lot more flexible on culture than perhaps a lot of people think you need to be. Right, right. And uh, Martin, you were telling me backstage, or not so backstage, that uh, Pipedrive is somewhat hiring obsessed. Yeah, we're totally obsessed with hiring. Um, a little bit, yeah, on the, on the crazy side, I would say. So what do you guys think? Like, how many employees can uh, a founder interview? So going from the first 10, uh, 10 employees, 20, 100, kind of how long can you keep interviewing every candidate that joins the company? Well, you can't really answer me. So uh, the answer for PyTrive is there are more than 400. 
More than 400 employees that joined the company got interviewed uh, by one of the founders, either myself or Timo. We're that obsessed. Like the, uh, the process of hiring is so long and so complicated that uh, once you get kind of through that uh, funnel, uh, you're really happy to join Pipedrive because it's, uh, it's been a kind of uh, gruesome experience. Uh, but at the same time, that also ensures that everyone that works at Pipedrive um, kind of belongs at Pipedrive. And uh, I think that's the only way to really ensure. And I, um, I agree with you that you know, the, uh, the values are much more important than kind of making sure that every uh, office has the exact same culture. But at the same time, the values are, uh, therefore, even more important that kind of every single person that works at the company also shares all of these values. And we don't make any exceptions for kind of, OK, yeah, these, uh, these people in that office, they're kind of slightly weird, and they don't match kind of five of the six values. Uh, that can't happen. So uh, having this kind of really long and complicated interview process and having the, uh, the founder interview in the end uh, kind of really helped us kind of scale kind of way beyond uh, that anyone believed that it's kind of reasonable to be higher, higher than kind of interviewed by a founder. And do you see that as being able to scale up continuously, that kind of approach? There's no reason for, uh, for you to double in size and still be able to maintain that? So at some point uh, beyond 400, we realized that like, now, it's, now it's time to stop that. But at the same time, having 400 people that have been hired uh, like this also means that we have kind of a big enough pool to draw from. So everyone has gone through that process, and uh, everyone that is now kind of part of that hiring process uh, already has their um, kind of spidey senses tuned so they know what they're looking for. And uh, yeah, it's no longer necessary to have kind of that uh, uh, last founder interview. All right, thank you. Scott, how, what's your approach? Well, um, with, a, with a company called FAIR, in a world that's sort of become a me too world, you have to do things fairly. Um, one of the things that we really instilled in the company at the very beginning was this question that we would ask everybody who built a product, dealt with a partner, or dealt with an employee, is it fair? And if you're building products that are really customer centric, this is it fair question is an amazing way to start thinking about how to guide the business. And I know this panel is not about fundraising, but fundraising is about Team. amazing teams. And today, amazing teams are not just interested in solving big problems, they're interested in working for companies that have a purpose or a culture. And culture is absolutely critical to what we do. Um, I hope this is being recorded because I actually have somebody who works for me who's in charge of culture, and her entire focus is making sure that we are fair. And is, you know, I, I guess I get asked all the time because we're, we're working in technology, we're a hyper growth company, we're in automotive. I mean, this is an intersection of misogyny. This concept of is it fair in that environment really comes down to treating people with respect and having a culture where you have values that really start with people treating each other nicely. And <coughs> I've had a number of companies, all with very different names, but True Car, our ticker was True, and now Fair, I've got a therapist who thinks I've got something, to, something that I'm going through and that I'm working out in my life every time I name these companies, but one of the things we did not get right at True Car was this focus on a really amazing culture. I had this company filled with mercenaries. They were the world's leading experts at the things they did. And in the end, when I decided to retire, I felt like a zookeeper who had let all of the fierce creatures' cages left open. <laughs> it, it created sort of a leadership vacuum. And in starting FAIR, when I started the company, I wanted to create a company where we would not tolerate brilliant jerks. And that singular focus has really come down to making sure that our hiring is all about matching personality and the culture with talent. And we will walk away from somebody who is the world's best expert if they are not a good cultural fit. And with the exception of almost one or two people, we have done that. And every time I've overridden the decision and said, no, this person is necessary. I used to be in the military. I used to always make the argument, you don't need to like your sniper. They need to be a good shot. But every time I've done that, 
I regret it. We end up having a real asshole in the business that ends up becoming toxic and creating problems that are much more expensive and much more of a setback for the business. So culture to us has become one of the most important dimensions of what we're building. And I couldn't even imagine today building a hyper growth company in tech, especially in auto, without making culture the key priority. And I see that, I see in Silicon Valley, it is now integral to how companies are formed right from the very beginning. Um, Andrian, uh, do you guys follow through with ethics codes now as you're growing? How do you make sure everyone's held in line to a certain you know, uh, a, a list of values that you know have to be part of the company? So we're trying to make everyone super comfortable at work. In our office, we do have even a barber shop. So if you're like just trying to, so we're trying to make everyone very stylish at our work, you know? So people, <laughs> uh, just a friend of mine, he's a barber and he is like, well, I do have a free time and I'm ready to get paid in cryptocurrency. I'm, re get ready, I'm ready to get paid in your know, STQs. So it's our token company called Storica. We're just like, well, I'm not sure that you're gonna get much, but at least you can also practice. And he was like, well, that's cool. And when I told that about our uh, developers to our marketing team and uh, all the team was super happy because like, you know, sometimes when you do have important things uh, during the evening and during the day and you just can have some kind of like extra, extra cookies from your, from your uh, work. And uh, we do even have a very cool crypto cafe and people just inviting their friends to uh, just spend time at the, at the, at the office. Right. So it has to be super comfortable for people to be there. Uh, and well, we do not have any kind of dress code or something like that. People got to do their job. And if they're comfortable sitting in front of laptops in pajama, then mm. they can sit in pajama. Right. Oh, but no one comes in pajamas. Uh, so okay, great. we do not have some kind of strict rules, but we're like, we do have, like, for me, it's not a problem to take trash out of the office in the evening or uh, for someone else's to clean up to, after someone. So it's just traditional rules. And as I told you, from the energy level, you do feel uh, like, is it the right person to be in your team or not? Mm -hmm. And if you do feel that this person is not as qualified maybe as you want to, but uh, this person is absolutely loyal to uh, the goal, totally loyal to the main vision you want to bring to this world, then this person is definitely worth to be in your team with you. Okay, cool. Well, Melanie, we're in Europe, we're not in Silicon Valley, there's a whole world of difference between the two. How is gender diversity, how is ethics codes, how is addressing the seeds of toxic environments in the office. How do you even relate to all that and specifically for a growth stage company that's rapidly growing? Yeah, um, I, mean, we, I mean, we're not as big as these guys, so we're 30 people at the moment. So we haven't kind of got to the stage where we have very strict processes and ethical guidelines that everybody has to do. Um, we're kind of lucky that we're still in that stage where it's, it's all done on mutual respect, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, we treat everybody as adults just as you would want to be treated yourself. So, you know, there's, there's no dress codes, there's no office hours. If you need to work at home, if you need to do what you've got to do, that's fine as long as you are doing your job. And, you know, we trust people enough that we know that they're going to do that. And that very much comes into the hiring process that we're looking for people who can kind of fit in and feel comfortable in, I guess, a less structured environment. Mm. Um, in terms of gender diversity, again, we haven't really got to that stage where we have any targets or anything like that. Um, my experience of my company has always been very positive. Um, we are lucky that we actually do have female developers working in Madrid, which um, actually surprised me. I hadn't actually met and worked in a company with female developers before. Um, but to be honest, we're still very much in the family kind of environment stage. And I think until we get to kind of the next piece, that would be then when we'd have to start kind of rethinking what those, those guidelines would look like. Perfect. Martin, I think yeah. you guys are obsessed with uh, <laughs> We're not obsessed with uh, kind of Gender codes diversity. or kind of policies or any of that stuff. Obviously, if you have a company like ours, uh, we have several offices. We have more than 30 different nationalities in a team of 400 people. Um, so 
some things will have to be educated. Um, so there's no common sense with so many different people and so many different backgrounds and, and cultures. Um, so we try to kind of educate people, not kind of uh, enforce policies or, or stuff like that. So for example, uh, we got started in Estonia. We have a lot of Estonians in the company. Estonians like to go to the sauna uh, naked. There are some cultures in the world that don't really appreciate that. So not the only kind of uh, tolerate the fact that someone goes into the sauna naked, but kind of seeing that is kind of offensive to them. So we've had to educate our uh, Estonian-based uh, people by uh, kind of going to the sauna at the company event when there are kind of other people around. Kind of uh, put on your swimming trunks. You will survive this one time going to the sauna, uh, not being naked. Um, so there are some kind of things that come up uh, that are very, very different between different uh, folks and kind of more than 30 different nationalities. Obviously, you need to educate. And kind of having this understanding that there's no kind of right or wrong uh, in some of these cultural differences, but there's just kind of uh, differences. So kind of educating all of these different parts and making all of them understand uh, the viewpoints of other cultures um, is a really interesting challenge. And once you kind of if you have a good group of people that all kind of fit the values, uh, then um, you don't really need to kind of worry about these kind of extra uh, awful things like right. harassment in the office and stuff like that. Right. I mean, Scott, in Silicon Valley, again, I'm going to keep it bringing up the two worlds because to me, it's two different creatures altogether. And a lot of the things that I might bring up in Europe aren't actually as big issues, apparently, in Europe. Like, I just don't come across them. Like, how do you police assholes, like you mentioned? How do you yeah. do these things right from the ground up? So, you know, I, I think that uh, culture is a leadership issue. Um, and it really starts with the leader, the, the founder, the CEO, and the senior leadership of the company and how they're going to set the tone. Um, it's, inter it's interesting building a, a company right now where you've got this sort of me too overhang. I have two daughters. Um, I've got four kids, two boys and two girls, and I can tell you one of the things that we do internally is we look for leadership and we try to train people to take on more responsibility and accountability in the business. I came out of the military and sports, and just being a lifelong company builder, I can tell you that right now is an amazing time to put women into roles that they're not necessarily qualified for. And this is a really interesting thing because in technology, we tend to only look for people who have checked the box in terms of their resume before they're qualified to get an engineering job of one sort or another. But what we're finding right now is that women, as long as they're articulate, ambitious, passionate, are so amazing to put in positions where they are way out of their depth. I, I can go through almost every position in the company where we have hired a woman who is not necessarily qualified for that role, but was hungry for it and eager to fill that role, they have stepped up and they have become such leaders within the business and they do so much more than their job. They actually reinforce this notion of culture. When I started FAIR, I had just read this book called The Athena Doctrine. And the first thing I said was, I, I'm going to just hire women. And of course, you cannot just hire women. Then you have a whole nother set of problems. And I think that this idea, though, that I wanted to really focus on women started with, I wanted to see a world where my daughters would be empowered. And it turns out that if given the opportunity, anybody who is a real aspirational, and I think that if you think about what created the tech world that we live in today, there was an amazing window of time in the late 90s where young men who were gamers could all of a sudden get into work and make something of themselves and do amazing things. I think the same time is now for women in these companies where almost in every case, I put a woman into a man's job and they can do it three or four times better and almost everybody who was around me at the time says don't do it because they're not qualified. Give them the empowerment, give them the opportunity, they will amaze you. Awesome, and I mean, I mean, like stepping out of the, the toxic workplace uh, topic and going back into when you're in growth stage and you have early employees, um, employees who are witnessing a huge changes in the organization. Um, just to finalize with one thought on each, from, from that point of view from all of you guys, how do you approach um, making sure that 
the community isn't lost in the beginning and as it grows, and that you hold on to talent, key talent that started with you right from the very beginning? Well, in my opinion, if you want to have a client, as uh, one of my partner probably said today, if you want to have a really like good amount of clients, you, you, they got to be attracted to you, they got to come to you, and you got to treat them uh, as your CEO treats you. So in my opinion, you got to have a very, very good culture inside your company. And if you do that, just, just to treat everyone like, like you treat yourself and, mm. and you're fine. Sure. Okay. Melanie? Yeah, I think um, I, I was at Amex a few years ago, obviously a very corporate organization with lots of structures and processes, and um, you have a very clear kind of career progression in that sense, um, whereas obviously in startups, you don't really have that. Um, and I think you have to remember that whilst you don't have a six-monthly review with somebody, it's a continuous conversation that you have on a weekly basis. So right. making sure that you're always engaging with what their needs are, what they want to get to, and making it a whole part of the journey for everyone, and then you kind of move away from it being this kind of progression piece. Yeah. Martin, I'm sorry we're out of time. I think, uh, thank you guys all for, for uh, sharing all these insights. Thank you. And enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you. Thanks.